word and this wonderful study, book of Revelation. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you will help us to get a little continuity, continuity going in our study, that we'll be able to have several uninterrupted un- 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 sessions. I pray, oh, Lord, that you'll give me the ability to speak once again. And Father God, that we'll just really get a blessing out of this lesson tonight. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's been a long time since I had to speak. Yeah, I'm a master of the English language. All right. One of the things that I, I want to share with you, I, I do really truly want, truly want to get some continuity going, uh, but we are going to get interrupted on, on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving because we typically do not have a service on Wednesday before Thanksgiving so that folks can cook and whatnot. And then Christmas and New Year's also, both of them fall on a Wednesday night. So we're, we're still going to get interrupted, but we're going to do our best, and then when January gets here, hopefully we'll get a good, good stretch, and we'll really start to, you know, get a feel for the study. Now tonight, we're in Chapter 6. Now what Chapter 6 means is, uh, we like to refer to that, that is when the four horsemen of the apocalypse ride out, which is, you know, basically that is the beginning of the tribulation period. So it's a very important chapter in our study. Now, uh, when you talk about the four horsemen, you know, we, we don't necessarily know when they, it, this is going to begin, when the first one's going to ride out. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. You know, it could be that that horse is already ridden out. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Now, like I said, we enter in the tribulation period this particular time. We have spent the last two lessons, the last two chapters, basically going into great detail about the throne room in heaven. We're very familiar with that now. We've talked about the throne. We've talked about the Father who sits on the throne. We've talked about the church. we mentioned several things about the church. First of all, it is represented by the 24 elders. Uh, they have been uh, rewarded, uh, have been glorified. And here's the other thing that's very important as we get into chapter 6, is the church is offline. In chapter 4, the very first thing we see is John gets another vision, and he says, is, come on up here, and I will show you what must take place, okay? At that particular time, we don't see the church mentioned ever again until it's implied it has come back with Jesus in chapter 19. That is very, very reassuring as we begin this particular part of our study. You know, you'll be very grateful that we're not part of this. Now, we talked about the Holy Spirit. The seven spirits are present in the throne room. We talked about the four living creatures. And then we went over to chapter 5, and we see the one star that was missing from all those that I just described was the lamb. Well, he makes his appearance in chapter 5 as the lamb that was slain, and he's in the center of the throne. He's in the center of everything, okay? That's because the lamb is Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the most important character. Remember, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he's made his appearance, so now everything is set, like I said. Now, God the Father has a scroll in his hand, and he looks, you know, and and they look for someone in heaven, and uh, in the beginning, no one in heaven was found to be worthy to take the scroll from the Father until the Lamb steps up. You may recall that John was weeping when he saw that. That's because John has been so looking forward to God making things right again that the idea that no one was worthy to take the scroll and open the seals, you know, and begin the process of reclaiming earth really devastated him. But anyway, that got taken care of. And so we have a worthiness that only Jesus was up there of all these very important people. Remember I was telling you that Moses is up there in spirit. Uh, you know, uh, the, the apostles are up there. Uh, Elijah's up there in spirit. All these people and these angels and everybody and Gabriel and, and, and uh, Michael, the archangel, they're all up there, but none of these guys are worthy to take that scroll except for the lamb that it was slain, which is Jesus. So we see worthiness at a, at a level that's beyond our ability to understand. And then, of course, we see holiness up there in the throne room. It is way beyond our ability to process, okay? That's what we've seen up to this point. Now, it should be noted that uh, the word throne is used in the book of Revelation 40 times. The word lamb is used in the book of Revelation 28 times. 
So this is very important we remember that. Now, I want you to think about this. You may remember when we f first started this study, I pointed out that there are several other books in the Bible that are very important to end times prophecy. And, you know, there are many more than I'm just mentioning here. You know, uh, Zechariah, Ezekiel, and uh, Isaiah, they all have, you know, elements of prophecy. But the ones that are probably the most important, first of all, is the book of Daniel. Then we have First and Second Thessalonians, and then, of course, we have the Olivet Discourse. Now, Matthew's version is in chapter 24 and chapter 25. Now, this, between those books and the book of Revelation, they are all intertwined, and they tell a consistent story. Now, I said that because we're going to be in all of them tonight. We're going to be bouncing around, and it could be easy to get lost. I will try to slow down because, I mean, I've studied this book for a long time, and I realize a lot of you have not. But anyway, let's start with Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. It says, I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror, bent on conquest. Notice the voice like thunder. What do we know about peals of thunder and flashes of lightning? We know that when you see that in heaven, we're getting ready to see judgment. So you can guess that that thunder means judgment is coming. Now, who is this guy? Well, it's not Jesus. Now, the natural inclination is to think, you know, white horse, that's a good guy. It must be Jesus. And that's what Jesus does when he comes back in chapter 19. When he comes back with us, to, you know, the church comes back with him. He's on a white horse. But this is not Jesus right here. This is a counterfeit of Jesus. This is a satanic imitation of Jesus. And that's what the Antichrist is, okay? Now, the first seal is basically the beginning of the end. Now, if you were to go over to Matthew chapter 24, verse 3 in Olivet Discourse, I'll go ahead and shit set the table and show you what Jesus has to say. In verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Now, obviously, this for, first horse in Revelation is the Antichrist. It's, he's bringing a message of peace. Now, underline that. He's bringing a message of peace, and he deceives the world because he's a political leader, and he comes and he has all the answers for the vast amount of problems that the world has. This is a guy who says he can fix things. That's who he's pretending to be. He is not a warrior at this particular time. At this particular time, he comes on the scene and he is a political leader. That's how he comes into power. And there is much more to get into that we'll get into when we revisit the Antichrist in chapter 13. But right now, that's enough. Now, the Oliver Discourse... You know, when he's speaking, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to the people who will be alive when this takes place, okay? So we can understand that. But here's the part I want to highlight. Deception is everywhere. Deception is everywhere throughout this whole deal. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that going on today? Do we have a problem with deception today? Would you say it's more of a problem than it's ever been in your lifetime? Okay, where's it coming from? It's coming from everywhere, okay? But it's coming from the, the news media. It's coming from the Internet in a, in a really big way. It's coming from social media. It's just coming at us, you know, full force all the time. We have to be diligent <coughs> to stand a chance of understanding what's real and what's fake, what's, what's the truth and what's not. And most, here's the problem. Most of us don't want to invest that kind of time, okay? Now, if you did want to invest the kind of time, you could do the research and you could pretty much tell if something is, is, is the truth or not. You know, it's out there. It's not hidden from you. But what people who want to deceive you count on is they count on you listening to that first thing that, they, that you hear and taking that as the word. And then you run with it, and next thing you know, you spread it around, 
And then you probably don't even realize it was not the truth to begin with. And that's what we're all guilty of. We get our news and sound bites. We don't take the time to research whether it was true or not. Well, in the day and age that we live in, the day and age of deception, if we don't research what we're hearing, especially anything of any importance, then guess what? That makes us foolish, okay? Because people are out there trying to deceive us. Now, look at this in 2 Thessalonians. Let's bring what Paul had to say into this. It says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie, and so that all will be condemned that have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. Now, there are several things that have been said here that are of utmost importance. Now, evil is being held back. At the present time, evil is being restrained. Who is it being restrained by? It's being restrained by the Holy Spirit. Now, when the church is raptured, then guess what? There are God's people who are a strong influence in holding that evil back because they're spirit-filled, they will be gone. Now, the Holy Spirit, he's not going to be gone. He's still going to be there, but he'll have a new purpose because God is going to allow evil to have its way once the church is raptured. Thus, the Antichrist is going to come into power. But at the present time, the Holy Spirit is the restraining power. He's keeping things back. He's holding this evil back that wants to be unleashed, right? <clears throat> now notice the great rebellion. That's the turning away from the faith. Now, many scholars believe that that is a distinguishable event that Paul is talking about here. That You know, you can point to it. There are some, however, that believe that that's been an ongoing process, you know, a great turning of the faith, great apostasy that we're seeing with our own eyes right now. Now, notice how people are turning away from the faith these days. Notice how the churches are closing. Notice how the churches are empty everywhere we're going. Every time you turn around, if you're in my circles, you're talking to some pastor who's got a church full of empty pews, okay? It's just a common occurrence. Now, notice something else that's very important. A delusional spirit will be sent to them so that they will believe the Antichrist and all his lies, and they will follow him. Now, you remember that there will be a great revival during the tribulation period. In other words, there are going to be many that are going to come to Christ. That's why the Holy Spirit is still going to be here, as, as well as the 144,000 evangelists that we're going to talk about, the two witnesses, so, and there are going to be Bibles everywhere. So there will be a great revival. However, if you rejected Christ while you had an opportunity before the tribulation period, you will not get a second bite at the apple because you will receive this delusional spirit. So you will be incapable of accepting Christ if you reject him the first time. It's not like you get to say, well, you know, look like tribulation period started. I'm going to go ahead and accept Christ and be good. That's not going to happen. Okay? You understand? Anybody got any questions about that? Now, how does the age of misinformation that we're dealing with play into that? Plays into it pretty well, doesn't it? Now, you know, I think even more so, I, I, it started with the Internet, and then the social media that was born out of the Internet, and then the cable news that was born, and, you know, 40 years ago, that's grown into this monster that it's grown into, and now you have all these podcasts. Everybody, you know, we even have our own little show, Grace Baptist Church. Everybody can have their own show. 
We happen to have a, 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 a worship service, and that's what we're, I'm calling our show, but anybody can go online and they can create their own little thing, and they are. There's hundreds and hundreds of podcasts going on, and a lot of them are designed to deceive us, okay? Clearly to deceive us, so we have to be vigilant. Now let's go over there to Daniel. <coughs> now Daniel is the earliest of the three that I mentioned. He, this was... Daniel was taken captive, you know, by Babylon in 605 B.C., okay? So this writing was somewhere around 575 B.C., and in 924, he says this. This is very familiar to a lot of us. We've studied this many times. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people in your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and build, rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come, let me say that again, the people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood, war will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on a wing of the temple he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him now a lot's been said here now Daniel basically at this particular time that he's getting this vision the time that they have been exiled is just about up they were to be exiled for 70 years and Jeremiah who was a prophet that was a contemporary that was left in Jerusalem where Daniel had been taken to Babylon he had prophesied that, you know, that God would allow them to return after 70 years. Well, Daniel gets word about this. So Daniel prays, inquires of God, and God sends Gabriel to Daniel with this answer. This is Gabriel talking to Daniel, all right? Now, it's basically saying that at the beginning, there's 70 weeks of 77 years. 70 weeks of seven years have been decreed for your people. He's talking about Israel. He's not talking about the Gentiles. He's talking about Israel. Seventy weeks of seven years have been decreed. Now that begins with the, you know, the uh, edict that is issued to Nehemiah by King Xerxes to go back and rebuild the wall. If you pick up in chapter one of uh, Nehemiah, that's where you'll see that. Now that lasts for 49 years. That's seven of the seven years until the rebuilding of the wall, or some scholars believe that ends in the end of Malachi, which is where the New Testament and the Old Testament are divided. At Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Now another 62 sevens, which is 434 years, will come, took place between that period and the first advent of Jesus Christ, where the Messiah was cut off. That's when he went to the cross. That means there's one week that's still out there, one week of seven, one seven year period, it is still out there as we speak. Now, notice that he says the people of the ruler to come will destroy Jerusalem. What they did in A.D. 70, the people who destroyed Jerusalem was the Roman Empire. So that means that the Antichrist will come from the Roman Empire, the same people, the resurrected Roman Empire. Now, most scholars believe that, you know, he, he rises up and there's more visions that Daniel has that speak of a ten-nation uh, confederation, as which is the Antichrist, will come out of, okay? Well, there has never been anything like that in history until the last 50, 75 years, and that is the European Union, okay? Many suspect it is the European Union is where the Antichrist will come out of, okay? Now, it's more than 10 nations, and, you know, there's a lot of gray area there, but that's the best guess. Now, remember now, this has not happened, so we can't be for sure. Now, notice this. 
The Antichrist will make a seven-year peace treaty. He will sign a peace covenant with Israel for seven years. That will be the beginning of the tribulation period. Now, why would he sign something like that with Israel? Well, you don't take, you have to be a brain surgeon to see that Israel, by the time, you know, this seven-year peace treaty is offered to them, they're going to be dying for peace. Look at them. They're, they're being attacked from all sides. Just in the last year, we've seen that. You know, they're, you know, they're, they're going to be a country that's thirsting for peace. And the Antichrist, the guy that raises up, has all the answers to the world's problems, he's going to notice that that's one of the first things that he needs to take care of is get peace to Israel, and they're going to sign this treaty, okay? They're going to let their guard down when that happens. Now, then in the middle of the tribulation period, the Antichrist is going to reveal who he really is, and he's going to set himself up to be worshipped in the temple. False prophet. We'll go into that, you know, later in chapter 13 or so. But anyway, the temple will be rebuilt at that particular time. Now, notice Matthew 24. Jesus says something very similar. He says, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination... It causes desolation spoken through the prophet Daniel. Let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of his house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful will it be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Okay, it gets bad, and we're going to get into that, de you know, in detail in the beginning of the tribulation period. But when it hits the mid-tribulation period, when the abomination that causes desolation takes place in the temple then it's Katie barred the door. It's going to get really, really bad for humanity, sinful humanity, those that have been left behind. Now let's go back to Revelation, Revelation 6, 3 through 4. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. Now, notice that that peace that is established when the Antichrist rides out the first time, that doesn't last very long. He gets a leg in, and then he starts stirring up the people because this rider is also probably the Antichrist or the havoc that he creates, okay? Global conflict ensues like never seen before. Now, we're not just talking about the traditional wars that we see. We're talking about race wars. We're talking about religious wars. We're talking about civil wars. We're talking about drug wars. And by the way, on a humorous note, you know, we, we've heard a lot about a civil war here in the United States. I don't think you got much to worry about because what are we going to do, put uniforms on? You know, I mean, if there's a civil war, I ain't going to put no uniform on. So who you going, who's going to be the enemy, right? I don't think we need to worry about that. But there will be civil wars, okay? There will be massive unrest going on during this time. Now, in Matthew 24, here's what Jesus has to say. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Basically, when you see wars and rumors of wars, this is the beginning of the tribulation period. This is, you know, when the second horse rides out, the fiery red one, that's what he's talking about. These things are parallel with each other, okay? They're the same thing. Now, Jesus is saying, you know, much more is going to come. Now, if you look in the book of Revelation, you see much more is going to come. We just got started. We just got started. We've only popped two seals. We got five more of the seal judgments. We got the trumpet judgments. We got the bowl judgments. Each time we see that, the, the judgments increase in intensity, okay? So serious things are getting ready to happen. Now, the bottom line is, you know, Jesus is saying, you know, I just got started. Now, I want you to look at what we're seeing now. Now, let me clarify a couple of things. First of all, 
It could be another 500 years, you know, before any of this takes place. We don't know. We are called to be watchful. We are called to be ready. There's many parables that speak exactly to that. We're going to share one on Sunday. However, we don't know when this is going to happen. But you can't help but live in the times that we live in and look around, and you can easily see how it could happen. Would you, would you, would you agree with that statement? You can easily see how it could quickly escalate and that's be right upon us. Now, I want you to look at what's going on with Russia and Iran and North Korea and China. Just in the past few years, did you notice that they are now forming a serious alliance, even to the point that North Korea has sent troops over there to Russia to help them fight in the Ukrainian war. This is a recent development. So you see all this stuff taking place. You see things that we haven't ever seen before. Now, who's their number one enemy? Think about it. Russia, Iran, North Korea, and China. Who is it they all have in common that they cannot stand? The United States, right? They are absolutely against us. Now, the bottom line is God's directing the events here, but he's using his enemies to do it. Now, let me also note in Matthew 24, verse 10, at that time... Many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Now, this is what Jesus says that confirms what Paul's already told us about the great rebellion. Many will turn away from the faith. Now, when the church is raptured, then they're going to see an increasing wickedness like the world has never seen before. The love of many will grow cold. Now, basically, this should sound familiar, and none of this has happened yet. In other words, the church has not been raptured, you know, and we've already seen the hatred and animosity. To, what is that V word? Somebody say that because I'll mess it up. Vitrol? What's the word? Anyway, it, it's a real big word that I, 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 I can't handle. But anyway, you know, you've already seen this animosity and it, this, this buildup just happening now like never before. I mean, you know, does any of this sound familiar to y'all? You know, do you ever remember a time where we were at each other's throats just in this country like we are now? I mean, we are at each other in a big and powerful way. Now, it, you know, it's easy to visualize this, you know, playing out and escalating and get to the point that we see. And you, you can see how it can happen very, very quickly. Now, if the church was not there to, to restrain some of this, what do you think the world would be like? Remember, the church is going to be raptured. You know, it's going to be a free-for-all, right? Now, there's some more things leading up to this time. See if any of this is familiar. Look at 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Now, we see that in the church. We see that on a regular basis. We see people who are gathering around them, speakers and pastors that are preaching a doctrine, the biggest church in the United States is doing that. I won't get into detail. But anyway, they're preaching what people want to hear, okay? You know, health and wealth, you know, uh, gospel is, is one of the things that's been popular for years, okay? That's what people want to hear. They don't want to hear about judgment. They don't want to hear about sin. They don't want to hear about God's holiness. They don't want to hear about the end times. They want to hear this other stuff, right? But when I look at that, I also think that we're guilty. Maybe it doesn't apply, but I can't help but think, you know, that we're guilty ourselves of this because we gather around and we listen to the news outlets to tell us what we want to hear. In other words, we're all guilty. The left and the right's guilty of that. We listen to the channels that tell us the narrative that we want to hear. And oftentimes, we don't listen to anybody else, okay? Basically, we want to hear our truth, and we're not interested in whether it's really true or not as long as it lines up with what we want to believe is true. So we're all guilty of that. Now, the Antichrist is going to thrive in an environment like this. He is going to really have a field day when nobody is interested in knowing what the truth is. They just want to know what their truth is. He's going to have a field day. 
He's going to really be able to manipulate that situation. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think that's dangerous? Do you think there's any way we can ever get things back like they ought to? I don't see it happening. You know, I don't think that we as people would have the discipline that we need to have to make sure we're looking at a lot of different news sources, whether we like the outlet or not, because that would be what was required to get the truth. And I don't see us having that discipline. I see us doing what we normally do is somebody watches their favorite channel and then they sit around the pop belly stove down there at Papa Jack's and they tell all their buddies, you know, I heard about so-and-so and that gets all over and that's how we get our news, okay? And that's why we're so misinformed today. Do you see that scenario happening, right? Well, that's, that's causing a lot of trouble for us. It's going to be even worse, I'm sure. Now, how about this one? See if this sounds familiar. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with it. And that sounds like something we've heard every day for the last 15 months. Right there. Every day. Now, that goes back to those podcasts that we have. There's hundreds and hundreds of podcasts on the Internet. You can pick your poison. They'll tell you anything you want to know. You know, the cable news, there's just no boundaries anymore. But here's the thing that bothers me about the society that we live in. We have lost the ability to feel shame. We have lost the ability to feel shame. Because when you think about some of the things that we see on a daily basis, our parents would have been absolutely ashamed of what they're seeing. They've been ashamed of themselves for listening to it and buying into some of it. But we've lost the ability to feel ashamed. We accept things that would be shameful to our grandparents. They never would have accepted some of the things that we accept. Now think about that. Anybody got any comments? Where I used to get my store, my gas over there at uh, Buckhorn on 42. They got a pot belly stove in there. Them, them guys, they love to get together. <laughs> they solve the world's problems in there every morning. Now, I don't want to slander Papa's Jack. Somebody might be listening. So I was just using them as an example, you know. Now, let's look at Revelation 6, 5. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its horse was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wage, and three quarts of barley for a day's wage, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Now, that pale horse is famine. Now, many scholars believe that the rider of that horse is also the Antichrist or the chaos that he's caused, okay? So he rides out. He's got a message of peace, which quickly turns into a message of war. And now, you know, that pale horse he's the rider of, and that's famine, okay? Now, war is going to disrupt the food chain. So that's a natural byproduct of, uh, of, of a war. Now, what we're seeing here is it's going to get so bad, the economy is going to tank so bad that it's going to take a day's wage just to get enough food to eat. But notice something else, you know. Poverty will abound, but the rich are still getting theirs. The rich will always be able to get their wine. They'll be able to get their oil, okay? So notice that. Now, in Matthew 27, Jesus says something very similar. Nations will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Famines. Now, Revelation chapter 6, verse 7, When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Let's see. Its, its rider was death, and Hades was falling close behind him. They were given power of a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beast of the earth. I may have misspoke. That third horse was black horse. 
Now, ha now we have a pale horse. Now, war is going to produce famine. Famine and war produce plagues. Dead bodies lying around is going to be fertile ground for disease. So you see a cumulative effect. It's basically, it noticed that over a fourth of the earth at this point has been killed. Now, by today's population, that would be 1.75 billion people have already lost their lives. Now, I think the bottom line is you're going to know that it has begun. We have never seen almost 2 billion people die in that stretch. So you're going to know you're into something if you've been left behind. Now, let's not forget, a true believer will be in heaven. True believer represented by the 24 elders, that's who we are. That we're represented by those 24 elders. We are the raptured church. Now in verse 9, it says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. Now, this could be all martyrs, all Christian martyrs of all time, but that's unlikely. We're probably talking about the tribulation saints who had been martyred, okay? <coughs> Those who accepted Christ during the tribulation period in that revival that I've been talking about that lost their lives for the gospel. Now, they're over there, and they're crying out for vengeance. They're under the altar, probably the, the, the brazen altar where the sacrifice was made, where the blood was spilled for the animals. Now, they're given robes to wear. Now, this speaks that they do have some sort of temporary body because spirits don't wear robes, right? So that speaks to a temporary body that we must have in heaven because these guys have not been resurrected yet. The only ones that have been resurrected and received their new bodies at this point is to rapture church. That's us. We're the only ones, okay? The Old Testament saints have not been raptured. They're up there in spirit, but they've not been raptured and received their bodies. So um, we're, it's a safe guess that maybe they have temporary bodies before they receive their resurrected body. Now, finally, in verse 12, I watched as he opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair, and the whole moon turned blood red. And the stars in the sky fell to earth, and late figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll, rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Now, we have a great earthquake. That's not the first earthquake we see, but that's the first earthquake we see of that magnitude. And it plays out. The sun turns black. Meteors start falling from the sky at such a pace that the guys, every human being, sinful humanity is left behind. They start running for the caves. They're trying to get cover. And it's so bad that every mountain is moved, and they're all in there, and they're begging for the Lord to take them because who can stand against the wrath of God? situation we got there wouldn't you agree it's not something I would want to be a part of and I very much comforted that if you are a true believer you will not have to endure this but guess what we cannot avoid going back to the fact that there will be people that you love that will be there there will be people that you work with that could be there if it were to take place you know while we're alive think about that what does that tell us that we need to be doing we need to be sharing the gospel. We need to be busy. We need to be serious about our faith. Okay? You know, now, obviously, you've got a responsibility to share the gospel. And, you know, I'm not going to tell you that you don't. But generally speaking, you need to, you know, you need to be part of the effort to spread the gospel. Now, you know, for you, God might be calling you to keep the home fires burning here in the church, keeping kids or, you know, keeping everything moving in that regard, you're still serving the Lord. You're part of the effort. But then, you know, then there, there's those that are gifted to go out there and do the one-on-one -on -one stuff, okay? 
Now, where everybody's got a responsibility is if you know you got a coworker or whatnot, you should always be looking for an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. You see what I'm saying? But on a regular day in, day out basis, we're all gifted in different ways. Some of them are in-house ministries, you know, music and, and that sort of thing. And some of them are the guys that go out there to the host station, okay, and, and, and witness, you know, face to face, frontliners. But the point is, you do need to be part of the effort, if that makes any sense. Now, you're going to, that's really going to make a lot of sense when we talk Sunday, because we're going to talk about the parable of the talents, okay, which happens to be out of chapter 25 uh, of Matthew, which is also the Olivet Discourse, okay? So basically, we're going to get into that. Now, anybody got any questions? I know I threw a lot at you. Raise your hand if you feel like you got most of it. Please raise your hand. I mean, we'll have to do it over if you didn't. Um, because I was concerned that I was going to throw so much at you that you weren't going to get it, you know, it was going to just fly over you. Um, it's definitely fascinating. I, I would definitely say that one thing that you should note is how in 605, 575 B.C., before Jesus had his, you know, Olivet Discourse, Daniel was saying stuff that lined perfectly with what Jesus was going to say, and then Jesus was lining up with what Paul says, you know, a few decades later, and then it all lines up with what John is seeing in Revelation in A.D. 95, okay? It all is parallel. It's running together, okay? So that should make it even more um, substantiated. Would you all agree? All right. Anybody got any thoughts? I got a question. Yes, sir. When you say it while ago that when the rapture of the church takes place and the ones that don't make it, you say they can't be saved? Now, that is, that is the interpretation that I get. There's other, there are other people that see it a different way. They say they can't. But that delusional spirit seems to imply that those who have rejected Christ would be given that spirit so they will be unable to come to Christ again because they're going to believe the Antichrist. You see what I'm saying? You know, now we won't know till we get there, but, you know, I think the safe play here is if you've got a chance to accept Christ before any of this goes on, you need to take it, okay? Uh, but there will be a great revival during the tribulation period. There are some that believe that you will get a second chance at the apple, but I just wouldn't, I wouldn't count on it. That's my interpretation, and many scholars interpret it the same way, that delusional spirit will keep you from being able to receive Christ because you'd be following the Antichrist. You see what I'm saying? What about the Judas piece? Does that come later when the 124 saints go? Well, that's coming later in, in Revelation. Uh, and the Jews will accept, uh, the Jews will be saved. And that, you see that in chapter 11 of Romans, Paul says that Israel will be saved. God still doesn't have a program for Israel, but it comes much later. It's not like those that are rejected will be saved. Those that are alive at the time, when you see these two witnesses, basically they, they are murdered and they're resurrected and they're, they're, they're transformed into heaven and all the Jews see that, that's when they're going to become believers. We will get to that in the book of Revelation. Okay? Anybody got anything else? Whew. All right. Go ahead and pull your prayer list out, if you don't mind. Started. It's going to get very, very, but very, very interesting.